Through her boundless compassion for humanity, Supreme Master Ching Hai tirelessly traveled to many corners of the world to share the message of love and eternal liberation through God's gift to humankind, the Kuan Yin Method of Meditation. After 30 years of sharing her knowledge on how to live a balanced life while pursuing a spiritual path, she continues to dedicate her time and effort to uplift and enhance the life of all beings. Motivated by her unconditional love and overflowing compassion for our planet and its co-inhabitants, humans and animals alike. Supreme Master Ching Hai selflessly accepts invitations to share her insights and wisdom on the topic of global warming and climate change. Despite her busy schedule, Supreme Master Ching Hai also sets aside time to hold retreats and international gatherings with our association members to inspire and motivate, address any concerns for daily life, and answer questions on spiritual practice. We present to you Supreme Master Ching Hai's lecture titled, A Story About the First Disciple of Taoism at an International Gathering. Supreme Master Ching Hai's lectures are not a complete meditation instruction. Please do not try alone. For free of charge guidance, please visit www.godsdirectcontact.org or contact any of our centers near you. in spring, you know. <laughs> okay. Want some story? Good. Mm. A couple of story. You want the Zen or the Taoist? Huh? Taoist, good. They're full of mystery, huh? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Behind there? Try hold a good piece of very good. And I know you understand English, so that's... <laughs> I told you many times, uh, many years ago, you must learn English, okay? Mm. Uh, even if I speak uh, five, six, seven, or fifty languages, it's never enough, right? How many languages we have in the world? Tell me. Two hundred. Huh? More than two hundred. More than two hundred? Are you joking? <laughs> 
200 uh, we speak here only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> only in China we have 200 already, right? Huh? And in India how many? Uh, Where are the Indian? <laughs> yeah, about 15,000, huh? Uh, I'm telling you. We speak Baba Tower language, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, it's a good story. The first disciple of Taoism. Very interesting, huh? You know who is that? No? You know who is the first disciple of Taoism? Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu is not a disciple. <laughs> hmm. Maybe, yeah, maybe he was the first disciple of himself. <laughs> you see, Lao Tzu, huh? Mm. He promoted the Tao, huh? And after he's gone, they call himself Taoist. Yeah? Well, that's the problem. After Christ died, huh? They call himself Christian, huh? After Mohammed died, they call himself Mohammedan. After Buddha died, they call himself Buddhist. I told uh, my attendant yesterday, you know the cup that we used to have? The metal cup that you have, you know? <laughs> I said to her, this is too... I will come to the story, don't worry. Yeah, let, let, <laughs> let you be a little suspend. <laughs> suspend movie is always very nice, no? Yeah, we're waiting, waiting, like Christmas morning, you know? Okay, anyway, the best thing coming, yeah. Because we were talking about food, you know? And uh, because before, they, they didn't take uh, so much money, the kitchen, you know? Later, they said, oh, the food has gone up very high. And they eat a lot here. <laughs> they mean you. <laughs> I'm not sure. I said, oh, yeah, maybe it's true. Huh? I saw them have a big tray like this with many compartments, and it's all full like mountains. <laughs> Some of you, yeah? And then uh, she said, yeah, yeah, they don't have the metal cup anymore, you know, the non-rusty cup? Stainless. Stainless. Stainless steel cup. I said, oh, they don't? And she said, no, 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 they don't have that anymore. They, they, they make big tray right now, you know. <laughs> so I said, oh, I said, good, good idea, good idea, big tray, good idea. Because the cup, I said, the cup that was, I don't know where does the cup tradition come from. <laughs> Actually, okay, go back to all the way the, from the beginning, before we even know such thing exists. Uh, I had just uh, some... Uh, uh, people who follow me around, you know, become like the renunciate, yeah? And we don't have a home, remember? And we have like a fifth-hand uh, truck, <laughs> so we can pack everybody in there. And uh, one ten, about three, four people. <laughs> and the ten was very small, um, smaller than now, because we didn't have enough money to buy a bigger one. So some tall guy is sticking the toe out, you know. <laughs> and I used to come around tickle their toe. <laughs> okay. And then so we cannot afford to have many things, you know. We run around and we camp here, camp there, you know. So we just take those uh, little stainless steel cups, yeah? Because I told them that when I was in the Himalaya, uh, that's all I had. Yeah, I cook tea with it and I cook food with it. Yeah, but I I also say I have a little plate, you know, like a metal plate, you know, and I cook chapati on it, you know, <laughs> and also you can eat with it. Yeah, you cook and you eat the same same plate, <laughs> They're very round like this, and you put the dough on it and make chapati. Yeah, okay. So I have two things, you know, a round plate to make chapati be, because over there, well, chapati is the most convenient thing to make. You make a fire and you, you buy a little flour and you put water in it and you knead a little bit and then you flatten it, you put it on the plate and then two minutes you have your meal already, yeah? And I just have peanut butter and cucumber. Yeah, at that time I didn't have much money, I didn't know how to design clothes and all that stuff. And who buy anyway? <laughs> the monkeys <laughs> in the Himalaya. <laughs> So I took all my saving and just uh, eat, you know, one or two ruby per day, yeah? Anyway, uh, I have to make it last, you know. I didn't know how long I would stay in Himalaya. I haven't found a master yet, and I was walking all over from one ashram to another, you know? 
from one place to another, and it's very heavy to carry so many things. I told you already, I have only two pairs of clothes, you know, like a pyjama, like Punjab, yeah? like tunic, you know, the long shirt to cover in your knees, <laughs> and uh, trousers, yeah, and a pullover. But I never had a chance to use a pullover because I walk all the time and it's sweating. <laughs> when you walk, you're very hot, yeah? Even in the top of the Himalaya, I walked. Gango trees and all that, I don't wear any. No chance, too hot. No? Yeah, I don't go there in winter, you know, I have to tell you that. <laughs> summer, yeah. Summer, but still, all the mountain is still covered with snow. And the road you go in, or the truck going, are in between the mountains of snow. You know, they cut the snow, and the, the wall of snow is as high as the roof there. You see what I mean? Both sides are high like that, of hard snow, and the army, they cut it through so the pilgrims can go. In summer only, yeah? In winter, no access to the Himalaya. Uh, people stay there or they go down before that. Oh, why do we go there? Oh, God. <laughs> what was it before? Chapati. <laughs> Chapati. <laughs> <laughs> he loved food. <laughs> what was it before, honey? Uh, how hard do we... Uh, Cup. Oh, okay, okay. The tray. Huh? The tray, okay, okay. No, but you food again. <laughs> you love the food here, don't you? Okay. Did you eat already yet? Yes. yes. I didn't take up your eating time, no? No. Oh, I thought it's a nice time. We go chat. We don't do that. We go chat in the garden. We don't do such stuff here, no, no. <laughs> okay, anyway. So I cannot carry too much except these two pair of Punjab, they call it, but very thin cotton. And, uh, you know, that's it. And then, of course, undershirt. Huh? Unless I go, go, go. Two pair. One wash, one, one wear. But sometimes I have to wear it wet because I don't have time to to dry, you know? It's very damp in Himalaya. And it rained, when it rained, then I got wet. And when I wash it, uh, you don't have dry machine up there, do you? I, I don't remember, no? <laughs> I should have carried one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it won't dry so quick, you know? Next day we have to go. It won't dry so quick, so it's still wet. <laughs> no wonder the, the yogis up there, they have to learn two more heat, you know? <laughs> they, they generate the heat from their solar plexus, from the stomach, to dry their sheet, their clothes. I don't know how big the sheet is, you know. <laughs> I could have tried with my handkerchief or some you know, paper tissue, damp tissue. I didn't try it. I didn't have time to. So I wear damp clothes and a damp. And then after you walk a while, you know the wind, I blow it and the sun dry it. Even it's a Himalaya sun, but it could be warm also. You see, after you walk, yeah, the air will dry by itself. Only two pair of clothes. How can it get uh, dry so quick? Especially it rains a lot of time up there, even in, in summer, you know? And very, it's not very dry climate up there, eh? It's not like here, huh? Okay. It's kind of wet because the snow, yeah, melted, like uh, evaporate in the air, yeah? And the, the Ganges River evaporate also in summer a little bit, and then it's, it's all damp all the time. But it's a beautiful place, my God, so clean air. The sky is so blue, blue, blue. And the air is so clean, clean, yeah. I'm sure if you stay there long, you don't even need to eat. I eat very little up there. Hardly feel any hungry. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, but hardly, yeah. So I cannot carry a lot, so I carry this little cup, you know, smaller than what you have and a little plate. That's all I can carry, because I carry a lot before, you know, like everybody else, you know, we were a woman, you know, we need that, we need this. <laughs> ah, I might need that, who knows, we, we might need that, and just in case, and, uh, you know, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it won't harm, you know. <laughs> well, I can always throw it later. Ah, oh, I carry a lot. Sorry. Yeah? What? You better safe than sorry and squeeze everything possible inside the small luggage until it, you know, swollen up <laughs> and there's no more air inside anymore. And then I carry it, you know, on my backpack. And another handbag here, yeah, <laughs> and some pocket around there. <laughs> when I first came, I have ordinary clothes, you know, with a lot of pockets and a sleeping bag also and a stick so that I can walk with it, you know, climbing mountain and, you know, river and all that. But as I go higher, oh, heavy, heavy. <laughs> okay, maybe I have to see what is the priority <laughs> of all these hundred things that I have. Okay, okay, 
I'm sorry to leave, but oh, we have to. I, I sell it. <laughs> In India, you can sell everything. I told you already, huh? Every little thing from foreigner. Because, you know, you can sell something. I didn't sell expensive, but at least I have some back, you know. I didn't know I could sell it. Yeah. Uh, until I give it to somebody and he gave me back the money. <laughs> I said, huh? You give me for that? I said, oh, sure, sure. I buy outside, more expensive, so this is for you, it's good. I said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> From now I know I can trade, you know. <laughs> I make a little business <laughs> along the road. I sell in the umbrella, yeah. <laughs> Another pair of walking shoes. And then uh, what? The mirror. What do I need the mirror in the Himalaya? <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> and then the comb. Oh, no, need the comb. I just tie an onion knot of here every day for convenience. Okay, and then what else? Oh, all kind of stuff. I can't remember. Even the flashlight and uh, a jacket, you know, a thin jacket. And uh, okay, I can't remember. You know, woman, they took a lot of stuff. You know, you have wives, you know, and you are the wife, you know what it's like uh, when you go traveling, right? I have told you guys also here the climate is good, and you come only two, three days. But I saw a lot of people. <laughs> oh my god, big, <laughs> big suitcase. Yeah. I could hardly drag it along with her, you know? And uh, somebody has to help, you know? We rent a small car. A small van just for you to take you back and forth, you know. Yeah. So that uh, it doesn't cost too much, you know, for everybody. And then you take so many luggage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially women. I didn't see men do this as a woman. I saw it. Maybe it's not fair. I didn't see men doing it. Maybe I haven't seen it, but it probably exists as well, you know. <laughs> so I took this cup and probably I told some of the closed circle disciples at the beginning, you know. Oh, they all go out and buy the same cup. <laughs> I didn't know what cup I have, but cup they must have. <laughs> okay. My cup was a very thin aluminum, the cheapest one you can find in India, and the lightest, because the stainless steel is heavy too. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not much. You can see why, it's just a little cup, but when it's a little cup and a little plate and a little spoon and a little, you know, what else, a <laughs> fork, whatever, knife, and it's very heavy. So everything I use, you know, I'm very big, right? So <laughs> the smallest thing is better for me. So I, I weighed it before I buy, you know, like in my hand, how much it would weigh in my luggage. Yeah. Uh, so I can only afford that, yeah? Uh, one to get the water yeah? and one to cook chapati. Yeah. In the beginning, I cook chapati and water everything in that the little plate, but later I have a cup, you know, look more decent. <laughs> <laughs> also easy to wash the hand, you know? <laughs> okay, anyway. So I told them, and they go out by cups. And that's how the cups tradition <laughs> began. And then everybody by cup in Taiwan, you know? And then that's how the cups have come into <laughs> popularity. Ah, yeah. So, and yesterday, so I told one of my tenants, I said, oh, it's good that they don't use uh, steel cups anymore. Because I also didn't think that we should change, and you know, I didn't think of those things. You do what you do, I don't care, you buy cup, you buy house, you buy car, you buy whatever. <laughs> yeah, but yesterday, because we were talking about it, you know, and I said to her, it's good if they don't use a cup anymore. Maybe they shouldn't use a cup anymore. Because they can buy also like uh, the tray, that kind of tray that I saw that you have here. I mean, some of you, you know, <laughs> and many compartments, fruit, pudding, vegetable, uh, sauté, rice, curry, <laughs> mushroom, whatever, I don't know. I say, well, not too bad. She say, because they say they eat a lot, you know, they have like this now, they don't have cup anymore. So I say, well, maybe it's a good idea. You know, we're more civilized now. <laughs> we progress, no? <laughs> Spiritual practice, so we, <laughs> we need to expand our being somewhere. <laughs> and I say, oh, this is very good, so we should progress. You know, we should buy new things now, like uh, those uh, trays are good. I saw them with many compartments, yeah. and they put different things, and <laughs> they are like a small mountain. <laughs> Well, it's not that everybody puts small mouths on it, just a little hills, yeah. <laughs> I say it's good. You know why? I said to her, because the, the steel cup, 
Some people buy very deep, you know, so they can put a lot of stuff. I say, it's so deep. <laughs> it's so difficult to dig it out, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and if people buy too small, then they have to come back and forth many times. <laughs> Look like it's small, but come back ten times. <laughs> you know, and meanwhile, you know, waste a lot of energy already. <laughs> it just it. A little soup, you go back, the soup is gone, <laughs> digested, you know? So might as well, you know, tell them to buy the tray, yeah? And then they can see what they have, yeah? <laughs> they don't have to dig. <laughs> Maybe with a shovel or something. <laughs> like you dig snow in the United States when there's snowing so deep you dig it. So, okay, it's official, all right? You can. <laughs> You can renounce your old uh, cup <laughs> or keep it for extra in case <laughs> in case the tray is not big enough for you. <laughs> you can have a cup for tea or, you know, extra pudding, whatever, <laughs> your favorite. <laughs> All right. No wonder in the Buddha time he has um, a lot of precept, you know? The precept is not for you to become Buddha or anything. It's just for you to behave like a human. <laughs> because <laughs> one of the precepts is you should not uh, take more vegetables than rice, something like that, you know? And you should not take more rice than vegetable. <laughs> yeah, because some people prefer rice, you know? And then they eat a lot of rice and somebody else don't have. And some people prefer vegetable and don't eat rice. So they took a lot of vegetable and then nobody have any more vegetable left. You know, like we have a lot like this in Buddha time, probably similar, right? A lot of people in the congregation. I saw some precept like that. You should not use rice to cover the vegetable. You should not use the vegetable to cover the rice. Very obvious. Now you guys understand very well the, the meaning of those precepts, don't you? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, no wonder uh, before the Buddha said to his disciple or his attendant, some of the precepts you can do away with. Just keep the main one. <laughs> so I boil it down to the five, okay? <laughs> and try to keep those. Otherwise, you will have 250 something precepts, including the rice cover, <laughs> vegetable and vegetable cover rice. You know why? Why does the Buddha have such a precept for his disciples? Maybe somebody cheat, you know, put too much vegetable under the, uh, the stainless steel cup that you have and go just a little bit rice on top. <laughs> and people are short of vegetable, yeah? Or rice accordingly, yeah, something like that. Well, it's nice to know that the Buddha's disciples are also human like us, eh? <laughs> so no big deal, huh? Yeah. Anyway, those precepts are also very convenient for you. Hmm? Please write them down and remember. <laughs> Not too much vegetable, okay? <laughs> All right, good. So, let's do away with the cups, huh? And buy these trays <laughs> and enjoy your food. Hmm. Because if I advocate, you can go breatharian. Maybe you have to prepare a little bit, huh? Maybe get uh, one or two day uh, a month, try not to go with food, see how you go, yeah? have to prepare for, in case you don't have food, huh? Ah, uh, who knows? You know, the way the world is going. They don't listen, you know. They're eating the planet. Uh, it's not their fault, you know. It's not the people's fault. They have not been informed very well. You know, generation after generation, the tradition going down like this. You must eat meat, otherwise you don't have uh, protein, you get sick, you be whatever, whatever. The poor people, they don't know it. Even though religious scriptures have told us that, you know, we should not eat meat and all that, but they don't explain very well. You see, it's just shortened form. It doesn't say like, okay, why you don't eat meat, huh? Yeah, we have to say that people suffer, the, the animals suffer so much and all that. At those times, they don't have camera to even record how, uh, how cruel the practice of killing animals for food. You see what I mean? And even now, we have it, and they're all over on the Internet, also on our website, and we try to show it. But still, not many people look into it, you see, because the tradition, the trend is so 
deep rooted already in everybody's family, uh, from generation after generation already. And even the religious people, they don't look into the Bible to see the true meaning why we should not eat meat. You see what I mean? Just uh, mention passing by, okay, you have to have compassion. Ah, you must uh, not eat the meat, and that's it. You know, maybe it's not sufficient for the people to understand very well, yeah? You hear here, and it goes down, yeah? It's the poor people, they don't really understand it. That's why we go all out to help them to understand, to inform them, yeah? Because uh, uh, when we were born, our parents forced meat into our mouth, and we have to eat it, or else we get even bitten sometimes, right? Sometimes children don't want to eat meat, and their parents force them. Because why? Because the parent think the parent has been informed that if you don't eat meat, you don't grow up. And they want their children to grow up, you see, and strong and healthy. So this is from love that they do wrong things. Vegetarianism in Religion The Baha'i Faith Regarding the eating of animal flesh and abstinence therefrom, know thou of a certainty that, in the beginning of creation, God determined the food of every living being, and to eat contrary to that determination is not approved. Selections from the Baha'i Writings of Some Aspects of Health and Healing Buddhism All meats eaten by living beings are of their own relatives. Lankavatara Sutra Also, after the birth of the baby, Care must be exercised not to kill any animal in order to feed the mother with meaty delicacies and not to assemble many relatives to drink liquor or to eat meat, because at the difficult time of birth there are innumerable evil demons, monsters and goblins who want to consume the smelly blood. By ignorantly and adversely resorting to the killing of animals for consumption, they bring down curses upon themselves which are detrimental to both the mother and the baby. Kasiti Garba Sutra be careful during the days immediately after someone's death, not killing or destroying, or creating evil karma by worshipping or offering sacrifice to demons and deities, because such killing and slaughtering committed, or such worship performed, or such sacrifice offered, would not have even an iota of force to benefit the dead, but would entwine even more sinful karma into previous karma, making it even deeper and more serious. Thus, delay his rebirth to a good state, Karma means retribution. Kasiti Garba Sutra. Gaudai. The most important thing is to stop killing, because animals also have souls and understand like humans. If we kill and eat them, then we owe them a blood debt. Teachings of the Saints. Christianity. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Holy Bible. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. Holy Bible. Confucianism. All men have a mind which cannot bear to see the sufferings of others. The superior man, having seen the animals alive, cannot bear to see them die. Having heard their dying cries, he cannot bear to eat their flesh. Mencius. Essenes. I am come to end the sacrifices and feasts of blood. And if ye cease not offering and eating of flesh and blood, the wrath of God shall not cease from you. Gospel of the Holy Twelve Hinduism Since you cannot bring killed animals back to life, you are responsible for killing them. Therefore, you are going to hell. There is no way for your deliverance. Adelila He who desires to augment his own flesh by eating the flesh of other creatures lives in misery in whatever species he may take his birth. Mahabharata Anu Islam Allah will not give mercy to anyone except those who give mercy to other creatures. Hadith Do not allow your stomachs to become graveyards of animals. Hadith Jainism A true monk should not accept such food and drink as has been specially prepared for him involving the slaughter of living beings. Sutra Katanga Judaism and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. 
Holy Bible. Blood, meaning flesh. Sikhism. Those mortals who consume marijuana, flesh, and wine, no matter what pilgrimages, fasts, and rituals they follow, they will all go to hell. Guru Granth Sahib. Taoism. Do not go into the mountain to catch birds and nets, nor to the water to poison fishes and minnows. Do not butcher the ox that plows your field. Tract of the Quiet Way. Tibetan Buddhism. The offering to the deities of meat obtained by killing animate beings is like offering a mother the flesh of her own child, and this is a grievous failure, the supreme path of discipleship. Zoroastrianism. Those plants I, Ahura Mazda, or God, rain down upon the earth to bring food to the faithful and fodder to the beneficent cow. Avesta. Everybody knows that vegetarian diet is good for health and to save the planet. They will be awakening their own great, compassionate, loving self-nature, and then their level of consciousness will rise up automatically and they will understand more than they ever did and they'll be closer to heaven than what they are right now. Same with my parents, yeah? They don't know I go in the bathroom and vomit uh, many times. And then when they grow up and then slowly the children also get used to it, meat and they continue that way. And they think the parents are right, so they beat the children up also later on. <laughs> eat that, uh, finish that, you know, piece of meat, or else you don't go out to play, or else you cannot watch television, or else you don't have internet time, or you can't go to movies. Yeah, so the people are very good. You see what I mean? People are so good. You can see a lot of good people in the world. Of course, there are bad people everywhere. Sometimes they're damaged, you know, their brain damage, or they've been brought up in the wrong company, yeah? Or their situation forced them to do something wrong. But inherently, all people are good, because the souls are good. And they've just been cheated into this degrading situation, yeah, like everybody else. So that's why I love people, because they're so deprived, deprived of the real knowledge of everything, almost everything, except you can learn two and two make four. <laughs> Many things else is not taught in the school. And so how do people know? They were taught that they have to eat meat. Then they grow up believing the adults were right. And then you believe that, and you taught your children the same, and your children teach your children the same. So, and then because of that, this is the illusional king of karma, of maya. They want to cheat people into doing this. And then you doom, you finish. You, you are entangled in this killing and re-killing cycle, and that's how we cannot get out. You see how poor the people are. You see, they are innocent. They don't know anything. It's not their fault. And they look up to so many religious leaders. They are also taught the same. Even many Buddhist people, Buddhist religious you know, leaders, they are not vegetarian. You know that yourself, in different traditions, right? Yes. So now it's our duty, you know? I mean, if we love them, we have to help them now. We do as best as we can, eh? Even if we cannot save the world, we save the people who ever listen. Yeah? yeah? As many as we can, no? Okay? Better than none? Yeah. But if many more people are vegetarian, of course we can save the world as well. Hey? Eh? Yeah. And that one vegetarian people will make another circle of another five, ten or more vegetarian. And that five, ten circle of vegetarian will go out and make more vegetarian people and uh, we'll be okay. It will become like a fashion then, huh? become like a trend, and we'll be happy. Yeah, I'm still having hope. I'm still thinking positive. Are you feeling positive? Yeah. But just uh, try to see if you can go with the food for a while. <laughs> not here, not here. Here you come, you enjoy, okay? <laughs> if you want to try it, you can try at home, yeah? Uh, one or two days, see how it goes, in case, huh? Train in a little bit, yeah? And if you have a little garden, Plant vegetable for yourself, yeah? Plant the staple food, some beans and some stuff. Plant your favorite food, yeah? 
and then in term you harvest the seed and you can uh, store it and plant it next year again. Uh, we lessen the shortage of food in the world by planting our own food. That's also fine. Uh, I told the Supreme Master of Television to go and interview Helmut, you know, the guy in Austria, our disciple. It's been shown uh, like this week about organic uh, farming. He did not even use fertilizer and he used very little water. Like this, we save also water for the world, you see? You just know how. You cover them with like maybe a straw or, or grass, you see what I mean? Yes. The one that you cut in your garden, you have to cut your grass and you save it. Or the leaves or something, you save it so that the water will be retained underground and not evaporate into the air. Like this, you minimize water usage, and also you can uh, plant vegetable. He say for a family of four person, 300 square meters of garden, good enough. Eh? Believe it or not. Wow, eh? You have all the vegetable you need for your family. It's, it's doable, huh? Okay. Well, if you don't have it, then you go to your a brother and sister, whoever have big garden, are you? <laughs> you rent a place, a corner from him? <laughs> or maybe you cultivate all and share it together, huh? Yeah, why not, hey? And he say you need to work maybe half an hour to one hour per day only. Then you have enough vegetable for your family. Well, I tried some in Spain before, before I even know him. I uh, tried some vegetable, my garden, very small, but the vegetable grow very fast, and I eat some from it already. You know what I mean? Yeah, when I, I was in Spain, it grow very fast. Some vegetable grow within one week, two weeks. You can see already, and you can eat already, slowly, a little bit here, and then it grow back again, and you eat more of that. Yeah, very simple to grow vegetable. You don't even need to dig the ground, you know? You just uh, like uh, <laughs> put a, <laughs> a hole in the garden or something. <laughs> Don't even need to work hard, because if you turn too much of the the earth, then all the the nutrition will will be uh, disturbed. You know, the system of the earth will disturb. Yeah. Anyway, you can learn it from him. Hey, how to plant vegetable? Yeah. It's on our television. I especially ask them to go there. And, and made it for you, I mean for anyone, eh? for the viewers, know how to plant vegetable, to save water. Save water is not only good for the world, but it's good for your bank, right? <laughs> for your pocket, eh? Yeah. Everything you save is good for your pocket already, not to talk about uh, good for the world or not. You see what I mean? Yeah, because if you save one dollar, that means you earn extra one dollar without going to work, eh? And I'm sure if you turn off all the standby equipment every day like that, you save maybe a hundred dollar per month. Depends on how big your usage, and even more than that. Yeah, there was one guy in Africa. I remember he wrote to us and said thank you because of all the tip we have for saving the the water and electricity, and that the government had keep coming to look at his house three, four times to make sure that he did not cheat. <laughs> How come the bill was suddenly so low? <laughs> they come many times. Remember somebody wrote the hotline? I think a few months ago. And he thanked the Supreme Master Television for all the tip, you know, that how to save electricity, how to save water, and then now he pay very little. <laughs> so the electric company, water company, come into his house three, four times and could not find why it's so low, because they thought he cheated, you know? <laughs> but no, they didn't. They just saved, turn off electricity, turn into economize light bulbs, yeah? Turn off all the standby, even the small light that standby. Many things you don't need. When it had the small light of standby, you'd switch it off. You know, like you have, for example, television and the, the satellite uh, machine or computer. It had all standby light, and some light even have standby light, and some washing machine or some fan, everything have standby light, yeah? Even your uh, charger of the phone, mobile phone, have standby light. So whatever you don't need, uh, all the time, you put it on one of the extension, yeah, with had the standby light. And then when you turn that standby light off, all the things that you don't need, standby off together. 
television and all that, you know. And the thing that you you need often, you don't put it on those standby light because then the standby light has to be standby all the time. Also, <laughs> you know, from the extension, yeah. I have many many yeah. many socket. Yeah. Okay. So you have to organize a little bit. Then you don't have to work so hard. I mean, meaning you save lots of money. Okay. Yeah. Like you save how much? One hundred dollar per month. Just say like that. And then one year, how much? One thousand two hundred. Yeah. Ten years. Twelve thousand. Ah, how much is twelve thousand? A lot. Yeah. Especially if you put it in an account and don't touch, it will grow into like twenty thousand. You know, you put it over ten years or something, and then you can go on holiday for many months. <laughs> Come here and pay for the tray, <laughs> for the container of the tray. <laughs> ah, all right. So it's official, eh? You can buy your tray now without feeling guilty <laughs> and heap things on it. <laughs> okay, good. Now we go to the first disciple of Taoism. Dharma. Huh? Dharma. Not Dharma. Taoism. <laughs> you know the Tao. <laughs> okay. Taoism, Fon Lao Tzu, Chinese. This is a story about the first disciple of Taoism, uh, first disciple of Lao Tzu. Yeah? Lao Tzu is uh, not the founder, but <laughs> the one that inspired Taoism. <laughs> now, the first disciple of Taoism, yeah. Uh, there is a man called Wen Shi. Uh, when he was born, uh, there was uh, a purple cloud that descended into his mother's room, and lotus flowers blossomed in the garden. So, as a child, already Wen Shi was interested in Taoist philosophy, astronomy, and celestial divination. He uh, tried to absorb the essence of the Tao from the sun, moon, and the stars, and cultivate his virtue and hid his wisdom. Wen Shi served in the court of the Chou Emperor as an astronomer. One night he was uh, charting the course of the stars, yeah, because he's an astronomer. He saw a purple vapor rising out uh, of the east. So tracking it across the sky, he noticed that it was moving gradually toward the west. A sage is journeying west and will soon reach the border town at Hanku Pass, he said to himself. I want to be there to meet him. The next morning, Wen Shi asked for permission to leave the court observatory and be assigned to the garrison of uh, Hanku Pass. When he arrived at his new post, he summoned his subordinate, uh, Sui Jia, and said to him, If you see anyone extraordinary entering the town, let me know immediately. You must know that uh, in the old time, the astronomy is a little bit more mysterious. Yeah, and people believe in the the power of celestial movement. Yeah, but nowadays we observe with the telescope. Eh? Yeah, but in the old time, uh, these people they truly have to use their own wisdom eye to see it. <laughs> uh, of course, they can ob observe the the stars and the moon and the movement in the sky, but they also have to use different uh, method. To calculate, yeah, the event um, that uh, the celestial body affect the physical planet, they need more talent and more virtue and more inner connection in order to know all these things. Not just by observing the physical movement on the sky. That's why he. How come today is so hot? Are you hot? Are you okay? I guess I sit with all the light here. So you see, that's why he just saw a purple vapor rising from the east. 
yeah, and go across the sky. A vapor only, you know? It's not even a star or anything special. And he knows already that somebody special is coming from the east to go where even. Can you believe that? So, because from the childhood he already practiced virtue, remember before? Yes. And he very interested in reading the teaching of the sages, you know. At that time, they did not call it the Tao, but because now we have Taoism already, so they call it. He was interested in reading the teaching of the Tao. But maybe at that time they call it whatever, the Dharma, the teaching, the truth, the Buddhist, or uh, yeah. Okay. Because uh, Tao means the path, the way, the way to to heaven, yeah? So everything you can call the Tao, even Buddhist teaching, any uh, sage, saintly teaching, you can call it the Tao, okay? Mm. Therefore, this guy, he doesn't just have a telescope, eh? <laughs> and in the old time, we don't have telescope. We just had it recently. So in the old time, the astronomers are someone extraordinary, yes? Someone who knows the, the stars, not even by looking at it. Yes, someone who knows the movement of invisible uh, force without even seeing it. Yeah, someone who knows uh, the event that will happen uh, long before it happens. Yeah, uh, it's a combination of uh, astronomy and astrology and also uh, inner wisdom mm? to some extent. Yes. Uh, even though he had not met Lao Tzu at that time, he already possessed some quality of the inner connection. In every uh, country, there are people who have not uh, uh, maybe practiced Kuan Yin method, no, but they have already some quality, some talent, some leftover from last life that they have practiced, or something they have learned from other teachers, yeah? How to predict the future, how to foresee the event, and how to prevent some little misfortune, etc., etc., by correcting feng shui and all that. Yeah. Okay. So he was one of them. So he was so good because he was so virtuous. That's why he, he was very excellent in it. That's why the the king appointed him as a royal astronomer, and not just any astronomer of the king. You see, in the royal court. So. And even then, so much uh, desires for the Tao in his heart that he even forsake this uh, prestigious position and go away to some smaller area in a border town to guard one of the border uh, posts in order to meet this extraordinary teacher that he foreseen with his uh, extraordinary uh, astrological talent. So off he went. And he even told his subordinate, if anybody looks special, <laughs> uh, look extraordinary, please let me know at once. Oh, this is also a risk, you know? <laughs> How can you even see anybody extraordinary? Yeah? He probably looked like everybody else. Yeah? But maybe. It is possible, because let's face it, even if Wen Shi would know who is who, but he cannot stand in front of the front door 24 hours a day and looking for that extraordinary person. So maybe his subordinate is one of his so-called colleagues, you know? Uh, he is also well-versed in the astronomy and astrology uh, field. Yes, so he told his subordinate, if anybody special, extraordinary looking, please let me know. Right. Otherwise, he would not, cannot trust just anybody, you know, who, who doesn't know anything about anybody. Then how can he ever meet any sage or any special person? So this subordinate must be a trusted one, the one that works with him all the time in astrology and astronomy, maybe one of his close disciples. You can also see maybe aura, huh? extraordinary person. How you see an extraordinary person? Unless you are trained in the art of seeing the aura of people, or maybe you are gifted with it. Some, some people are gifted with it from the previous practice of the 
other lifetime, you know, so they can see people aura and they can know that okay, this person has bright aura. She's a good one. Yeah, that person look like coffee color. Oh, oh. <laughs> cannot do business with this person. Yeah, and he look like charcoal color. Okay, forget it altogether. <laughs> when I went to just a hotel, you know, there's one. Uh, they call it Vaturia, you know, the valet, the valet parking person. Yep. When you go in, you give him the key and he park your car, and when you yep. come back, he bring your car to you. A valet. Yep. Yeah. Even one of them saw my aura. And he said, Oh, uh, many thousand, thousand, thousand passed by. And you, you see one like that. He told me like that. So, how would he miss? You know, I said, How do you know I'm different? So he said, Oh, no, this is very different. You don't see this. <laughs> you don't see this often, you know. <laughs> and he was even kneeling in front of me, <laughs> in front of the whole hotel. It was a big hotel, you know, an international hotel. I was embarrassed. I said, Get up, get up quick. <laughs> He's so tall, very tall, so, so, so he don't want to talk to me from uh, up the cloud. He, <laughs> he kneeled down, so that face to face to me. <laughs> so funny, yeah, and, and I told you, and sometimes police, they know that, and sometimes the police use some special person yeah. who can uh, read the aura, and then you know whether the person is a good or not. Because sometimes they worry they accuse the wrong person, even though all the evidence point out that that person is a criminal. But sometimes it's not like that. Evidence doesn't always mean correct judgment, yeah? So the police sometimes hire special psychics or some special person who can read the aura or can tell the heart of the person. They call it Tai Ching Tong. I mean, you can read the minds of people, yeah, to make sure that they don't accuse the wrong one. I wish all the police would hire these kind of people so that all the people who have been accused as criminals will really meet their judgment, you know, not, not the innocent one, yeah. And I wish that everybody can read Aura, then we know who's who. <laughs> and then everybody will just follow the Aura then. <laughs> then there's no mistake of following the wrong teacher. Yeah? yeah? But this is a rare gift. Yes. And I was surprised at that guy, you know, the valet, you know. And he, he can read it. Yeah. I meet to some people like that, yes. So these subordinate are not ordinary subordinate, hey? I think, huh? Yeah, all right. Because this is a very important uh, mission that he, the officer here, Wen Shi, entrusted to this subordinate. It's not just an ordinary task like go out and buy some tray for, <laughs> for, for the people here. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> because Wen Shi had forsaken his most prestigious post, you know, as an astronomer personally to the king in order to go all this way to a border of the country. You know where that is, right? Border town is not always glamorous or, you know, not interesting in that. And he forsake everything, left his home and, and post in order to go to that border town just to meet that special teacher because he knows he's, he's not a normal person. He said to himself, or maybe to his subordinate, I say it's journeying west and we'll soon reach the border town as Kanku Pass. So I want to be there to meet him, you see? So that to him is very important. He knows this is uh, one in a lifetime uh, saint. It's not an ordinary person that he wants to go there and just uh, chatty chitty, you know? <laughs> and so if he entrusted his subordinate, to look and wait for that person, then this subordinate is not an, an ordinary one, hey? Because it's so important mission, you know? Yes, of course, being an officer in this uh, border town post, he's also busy, you know? He cannot always stand in there or watching all the time or even looking in the sky to see the vapor or the star movement. Not all the time now, because before it was his job there. He can do that all day. Now he cannot and especially newly appointed, you see? He has a lot of things, uh, a lot of uh, office uh, papers to look at and the people to get used to, yeah, and new employees to work with and uh, have to talk to the people in the town and all that, and many things he has to do. 
especially office work. So he cannot just always uh, sit there and observe the uh, the movement, the stars, or seeing when the sage is coming or what. You see, this is a problem also with many of us. Even though maybe we can have this ability, but you see, if you're busy, you cannot catch it. Even the small things. I'm just telling you an example. The small thing, like today, the water cut. Yeah, for many hours. Yes, I knew that already last night. But what am I to do? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Then I'm busy with other things and I forgot it already. I thought, oh, never mind. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody already come and tell me that uh, save the water, save the water. You're gonna need it. But what am I to do? Go get the bucket and run around telling everybody. <laughs> We didn't even have buckets. <laughs> See what I mean? And even if we have buckets, how, how do I deal with these so many people like this? Huh? Four, five hundred people. How how am I going to get buckets in, in such a short notice like that? <laughs> For example, you know, luckily you were meditating. It's good that you meditate. <laughs> At that time. Less problem. So less problem. Otherwise, everybody just go in out of the toilet, then we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> you don't even know what happened when you come out. <laughs> Everything, uh, the, the water come back again. Yes. Anyway, we okay. Okay, it's good. For example, like that. Even something I know, but I'm busy. You know, I have other things to do, more important than than the information I get. You see what I mean? Yeah, more more important and more pressing. So much work to do, paperwork and all kind of thing. The time consuming and also deadline stuff, you know. Even if I know something, I don't have a time to take care of it. <laughs> Remember the jokes say, Oh, I don't have any problem because I have so much already. If I have a new problem, it has to wait for two more months <laughs> to be looked at. <laughs> yeah, a problem has to make an appointment with me. <laughs> and, and I look at my schedule whether I have time to, to see you the problem or not. <laughs> and not like, okay, you can make an appointment with me, no. Because sometimes important people really want to see me, but I can't make time for them. I can't make time. I really can't. <laughs> so much work to do, you know. It's good, it's good to, to have work to do. It's better than spending time doing nothing, idling around, you know, and and the mind will not be good, yeah? Rusty also. It's just it's, it's truly too busy, then you cannot do much thing that you want to do also, and sometimes you know something, but you cannot take care of it, yeah. The same in my house, you know, I have uh, five or uh, six attendants, but they all attending to dogs and birds. They <laughs> I got to cook for myself, warm up my food if there is any. <laughs> Every time I ask for somebody, oh, he's with the dogs. <laughs> ask somebody else, he went out and buy food for the dogs. Uh, how about, <laughs> how about, no, I asked for A, oh, he's with the dog. How about B, he went out and buy food for the, the birds. Uh, how about C? Oh, he, he, he take a, a, a dog to the vet. And how about D? <laughs> he's cooking for the pet right now. <laughs> how about E? Oh, he's cleaning the dog's room. How about F? He's cleaning the bird's cage. <laughs> no, I, I have one. Actually, I have a couple, but uh, I don't know. I cannot tell you. Forget it. <laughs> Sometimes female, we need male also because they have muscle. You see? <laughs> sometimes female don't drive car as good as male. I have to tell you, I don't know, it depends on who. Sometimes female good, sometimes male good, but I have to be lucky to get the good one, you see? That's the problem. <laughs> so I have to make use of what I have. Huh? You don't have what you like, you have to like what you have. <laughs> yeah, they can do everything too, but they need time. It's not that they cannot do anything. What I mean is they're all busy. You know what I mean? And then if we have the house, because I need it for dogs and birds, and then we have to repair it here and there, you know. And water, <laughs> leakage, you know. It's like if you have a house, it's really a problem. You're always in the, in the hardware store, you know, <laughs> buying screw and scrap and uh, all kind of things. And if you have pets as well, a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of work. 
because my dogs, they don't just run around in the garden all day. They have to go inside the house. If I don't let them, they're scratching the door. Hmm? So we have to clean them up before they come in. They jump on sofa and bed everywhere, you know. If you don't clean them, you have to clean the bed every day. Wash the sofa every day is the same. I like them clean also and uh, nice and because I hug them and kiss them, you know, so <laughs> it's also for me, yeah. And they, they eat, and sometimes they eat from my table, so if the, you don't clean them, then how you bear it? So anyway, very, very, very hard work, you know, like four or five times a day, the dog have to come in and out and then eat and wipe up and clean up and then go out walking. Every time walking, like half an hour, you know, and come back cleaning another half an hour and feed another half an hour, this time is gone. Then they have to wash their bowl and wash their towel that they clean them. You know, the dogs come in, they have to spread the towel like a welcoming carpet, wash their feet first, and then they have to step on the clean towel, yeah? Because they come out and they're muddy, you know, they dig everything. They like to dig. <laughs> That's their job. <laughs> like you dig in your cup, you know? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> All digging. I know. So we have to clean them first, yeah? And, uh, wash them with the water and then put them on the clean uh, tower first, otherwise it's dirty again. And wipe their paw and then clean the whole body, you know, ear and everything. They go, wow, it's dirty, you know, dusty. So it takes a lot of time to take care of these uh, dogs, yeah? And not just one dog, eh? And my attendant, they're very loving. They clean the dogs for hours. <laughs> they love to clean them. They <laughs> clean so so carefully and so long. You know, I say, ah, yeah, quickly, make it simple, man. <laughs> I need you. <laughs> and they are taking their time, you know. They enjoy the dog so much, they're taking their time. And pet, pet a little bit, and then clean a little, and then <laughs> carrots a little. And the dog licking them, and they're kissing the dog. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's like a, like the whole show. <laughs> so they take their time, you know? And the birds also love them, you know? They clean and they, they jump on their shoulder and then by the way, oh yeah, 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 scratching here and there and then clean again. And then the bird kiss, kiss, and then they scratch, scratch, and kiss, kiss, and scratch, scratch. Oh, that takes so long. <laughs> They're not just cleaning. They're enjoying each other. <laughs> You know, and then my dogs, sometimes they're so spoiled, they don't even eat from the bowl. I have to take it from the hand and, here, please eat. <laughs> so spoiled, you know, because I give them snacks with my hand most of the time. So when they're fed with the bowl, they say, what's that? <laughs> it doesn't look like what mommy used to give. So they also sit in there, sometimes they don't eat. Sit there and watch the attendant. <laughs> so the attendant, of course, they feel in pressure, you know, and you have to get it from the hand and then feed them. And then it became habit now. They are often don't eat from the bowl, they eat from the hand. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, oh, it's a lot of theater in my house. I'm just saying that even if you know things to do, but if you don't have time, it's also very difficult. Hmm? Hmm five, six attendant. It's not only the dogs. We have email, yeah, we have internet, we have sometimes have to send tape and all that for different area and re replying things and I have to print our letter and all that for me to read and to sign, all kind of things. You know, they're also busy, not the dogs. <laughs> I tell you, I'm just saying about dogs and bird, but they're also busy. Like if, if they're not with dogs and bird, then they are with the computer. You know, and you know how they love computer nowadays. The young people, they love computer. I don't know. I'm surprised they even get married at all. <laughs> they even fall in love at all because they, they love computer so much. <laughs> I wonder if they even even get out of the seat. Yeah. It's not only that, but they, they really have to work also on computer, you know, uh, for, for me, huh? for us. Eh? Yeah, okay. So many, a lot of work. And so even if sometimes I, I, I want to do something else, I have to wait because there's no time then. Yeah? Okay. Okay, let's go back here. <laughs> back to China. <laughs> <laughs> so we know he's very extraordinary, Wen Shi. And we know that his subordinator was also extraordinary, probably his best friend as well. Yeah. 
or his attendant next person. So now, not long after he settled in this uh, frontier town, the border town, Lao Tzu arrived riding a blue ox. Hmm. So Xu Jia hurriedly went to his superior and said, A strange man riding a blue ox is coming to our town. So Wen Shu was delighted. He knew this is a guy. Can you believe this? Huh? <laughs> you know, in the old time, you riding an ox is very normal. There's nothing extraordinary about it, right? Because uh, either you have horses or you have donkey, yeah? or you have ox, right? That's the mean of transportation at that time. Instead of you walking all the time, because probably he also have luggage, yeah? Of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> he must have some minimum stuff, you know? Like a tent and a sleeping bag, no? <laughs> and uh, stainless. stainless steel. <laughs> and a mosquito net like you do. There's not too much mosquito here, just share some, okay? We don't buy it. <laughs> huh? We don't buy it. It's one good thing, so you have less luggage to take care, you know? Because when they first arrive here, oh, they arrive with the whole household, ice them, you know? <laughs> oh, God. They immediately set up ten, 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 ten around here. You know those mosquito tent? Oh, I come out and say, what is here? <laughs> you have no room to walk anywhere. They settle down immediately. <laughs> the first thing they do is uh, open their tent and put it everywhere here. Oh, I said, my God, no need. Okay, I said, no need, no need, tent, it's okay, no need. And then they take out their second uh, backup uh, plan B. <laughs> because they heard it's summer. There's a lot of mosquito. <laughs> you know what I mean? So plan B is the mosquito net instead. <laughs> so they cover them and the hat, you know, a, a big hat, and cover the mosquito net on top and they sit there. <laughs> it just, it's just like another tent, <laughs> like a collapsible tent. The other one is a different collapsible. This one system is, is easier. You can put it in your handbag, you know. <laughs> so they have plan A, plan B, everything ready. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no need, no need. <laughs> Even if there is mosquito, a lot of you, everybody share one, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I'm not sure if they like you either, because you eat vegetarian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Whew, right. So he has a blue ox, né? the Lao Tzu. Uh, he, he ride on a blue ox perhaps with his uh, belonging, of course. Nah? He can't walk all this time, you know, I mean. In the old time, uh, China is big, you know, and they divide into many nations, yeah? So he probably uh, ride from one country to another. Even then, it's a long distance ride, yeah? So he need an ox. <laughs> it's very good. Right. Probably you can rent an ox, you know, <laughs> everywhere you go. <laughs> like you rent a car nowadays. <laughs> But I guess this belonged to him, because it's blue ox. I've never seen one. Never. No, no, it's a kind of bluish tint, you know. In China, in Vietnam, we have this. It's not completely black. It uh, has a very uh, uh, bluish kind of, of coat, you know, and their skin. And then, yeah, so I say a blue ox coming. Oh, probably he painted it, why not? <laughs> Huh? To make the story interesting, yes. <laughs> yeah, also that nobody steal it from him because it's a blue ox and he knows it's from him. <laughs> yeah. You know, in in China, they have a special dye, you know. It's uh, um, indigo, huh? Kind of. And uh, you can never wash it off. <laughs> so perhaps he just uh, uh, bath his ox with it once so that it will stay like that forever and nobody would ever steal it from him. Hmm? Okay, you can't wash it off. <laughs> so here he has a blue ox. Hmm. So Wen Shu was so happy, happy here. Yeah? He went to the city gates, bowed to Lao Tzu, and said to him, Today I have the honor of meeting a sage. Please allow me to offer you the hospitality of my town. Wow, what a mayor, huh? Yeah, this is the kind of politician that we need. <laughs> Everywhere, in all the towns, in all the countries, yeah? Have you met one? No. Oh, we met a couple, uh, the Hawaii male, 
right? Frank, Fassi. We met a couple already, huh? <laughs> no, actually, the mayor in in Manila, he also gave me a, the key of the city. Yeah, I did not give anything, donation, nothing at that time. Nothing. He just gave me the key like that. And welcome to Manila. And another, there's a mayor from uh, Arizona also gave me the key. A couple more, I forgot, I forgot. Uh, yes, and some mayor give me honorary citizen. Uh, San Francisco and Arizona also honorary citizen and the key of the city. And you know, the eight, eight uh, uh, governor states in America also give me. Yeah. You saw all six, but they give some more later on yeah, with our ceremony. Yeah. So actually, I'm an American honorary citizen, manifold. <laughs> tenfold. <laughs> Say tenfold. Okay. Yes, about that. About that fold. <laughs> We have some good one, eh? Perhaps they can see it, but they don't want to tell people. You see, because some people, when they have this kind of ability, they don't boast about it. What for? Nobody believes you anyway. Uh, very rarely people see the, the way they see. So if they tell everybody else, they would think, oh, no, this mayor, he's kaput here <laughs> in the head, you know? And maybe he will lose his job, you know? Yeah. People nowadays is uh, not too bad already, but in the medieval time, you could even get uh, a nail on the cross and burn even if you know something other people don't know, right? There's a witch hunt in those times, and uh, they just burn you on a stake. And nowadays, it's not that bad, but still you have to be careful whom you told, eh? because they would think you are a witch, yeah? And you might do harm to them. In, in fact, you don't do nothing. It's, just, it's like that. See, that's how Jesus uh, was uh, killed, you see? A nail on the cross. Uh, that's how Buddha has been attempted, assassination attempted on him, and many masters die, you know? Yeah. Very yeah, yeah. agonizingly. Huh? They called Muhammad uh, Majnun, it means crazy. What? Prophet Muhammad, they called him Majnun, it means crazy. Yeah, they call him crazy, Prophet Muhammad. But what did he do? He just teach people good things. Nothing bad come out of that uh, prophet. Peace be upon him. <laughs> yeah, this is a very nice greeting. You know, yeah. the Muslim when they see each other, they say, "Peace be upon you." Because at that time they did not have peace, so it's very good that they invent this greeting just to have a good wish. Yeah, where they were, people were warring against the prophet and his uh, disciples. Oh, terrible time they had. Terrible time. Not just Prophet Muhammad. All the gurus, many gurus of the Sikhs, have been harassed, have been persecuted, and Jesus, and many other masters, you know, have been burned alive or flayed alive or uh, executed, all kinds of things. Terrible. Yeah? Just because sooner or later some disciple would come to them. Just like this, look, Lao Tzu, he didn't even arrive yet. You see this? The poor guy. The poor guy knew nothing about the waiting disciple. He didn't even have one. He, he ride his own ox. He mind his own business. <laughs> he just go in there, yeah? Because he has to pass there to go somewhere else. You see what I mean? He wanted to go out in the uh, retreat by himself. That's what. So he has to pass the, the border to go out. That's how he got this, you see? Not that Lao Tzu has uh, some flyer, you know, maybe, <laughs> or send an email or have a Supreme Master television announcement, nothing. Huh? He has just a poor ox, and how slow the ox can be, and the news already came. I told you, yeah? But this is a true story like that. It's the same with me. I was hiding myself in the back room of a temple. Nobody even go there because they're afraid of ghosts. Because that's where they put the dead people's ash, you know? It's like a cemetery, but you don't have a tomb. Just, they, they burn the, the body, they cremated the body, and they put it in an urn, like small like this, and they put one, two, three, four, and it, it saved the space, you know? And uh, it's like a cemetery, and, uh, and they will offer money to the temple. You know, for that, the temple can uh, sustain themselves, and the people don't need to bury the, the dead. And also they think that in the temple they hear the sutra uh, uh, reciting every day and the souls will be liberated. So just like in Catholicism also, many churches, uh, backyard, front yard, are full of tomb, yeah? You know, right? Yeah. Okay. 
the same. So I stay in one of those a small temple room full of ashes. <laughs> nobody dare go there anyway, so nobody even know. Nobody even know. And then one day, you know, some people come knocking at my door and say, you know, the inner uh, dream, when I tell them to come here and find me, they know everything, my name, where I stay and what I teach and everything. And tell them uh, they come to, to learn, you know, Kuan Yin Method. <laughs> At that time, I didn't have a name for Kuan Yin Method. And they just say the Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, tell them go there and learn. So that's how it happened, you know. And then, okay, I left Taiwan, then I went to New York, I stay in another temple. And uh, come another group again, <laughs> say similar stuff. And, and can tell the detail of my daily life, so that to make sure that I, I believe what they told me. They told me like the detail only I know. You see what I mean? And not even temple people know, nobody there. <laughs> so, so this kind of thing really happened. Huh? So the poor master, eh? <laughs> and I told you already, even before that in India, I was just walking with my spoon and my cup and my <laughs> thing, <laughs> remember? And also somebody come to me and say, I want to sir, look at your hand. I say, I don't uh, have money to pay you. Uh, and he said, no, no need money. I just uh, want to look at you, uh, your hand, for free. I said, I don't believe in astrology. He said, never mind, it's no harm. Please let me have a look. <laughs> so I let him look. And how he look, and he tell everybody that I'm a Buddha and all that. <laughs> and then the disciple come knocking. You know, in my motherhood, there's no door anyway, there's no need to knock, they just walk right through. <laughs> I don't want to be my disciples. <laughs> For example, you know, I wasn't mature yet, I was unripe fruit. I didn't even know nothing about, about a, a master or disciple, nothing. And there was nothing like that in my mind. I was still walking around in Malaya, you know, from here, from one ashram to another, one place to another, just walking around. <laughs> so that's how it happened, you know what I mean? Yes, that's how it happened. You don't have to tell anybody, they just come. <laughs> and then five people come that night and then become fifty and then become five hundred and become five thousand and... Yeah, before you know it, you are master already. <laughs> so my first disciple <laughs> is in India. <laughs> so-called disciple, a reluctant master. <laughs> yeah, it was so cute. And when I passed him by, I visit him, and he go out and shouting on top of his voice, my master is coming, my great master is coming, my big master is coming, you know? A big master. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, Something like that, you know, and everybody listen, and then they all come also, and then I have to talk to them, you know what I mean? And then you have more disciples. <laughs> okay, so now he came out and greeted him with all due respect and humility, say that uh, he, today I have the honor of meeting a sage. Please allow me to offer you the hospitality of my, my town. You see that? He saw it by himself. The Lao Tzu did not know anything about it even. And nobody even told him, because at that time Lao Tzu was not uh, famous, nothing yet, you see? Uh, so he even know it, because this guy, I told you, he's extraordinary, yeah? He's not just a normal uh, people, he knows things, and he knows what's what. You see, can you imagine coming out of your gate to meet a total stranger you have never seen in your life? and decided immediately that he's a sage. So this guy, he must have inner knowledge very richly before he met Lao Tzu. Huh? Good. But that by no means that he's a complete enlightened person. You know what I mean? By no means. I mean, he has uh, divine power. He has like magical power, yeah? Astronomical power. He has the knowledge, inner knowledge of the movement of the celestial body, yes? And he also can see uh, the uh, atmospheric uh, change to predict something. Like somebody know tomorrow will rain, Some, because they can feel the atmospheric change. Second level. What? Second level. <laughs> no, first level, good enough. <laughs> good enough first level, yeah? And there are a school who teach these things also, yeah? The magic school. 
Hogwarts School. Hmm? <laughs> 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 What a very uh, suitable name, huh? <laughs> oh, Hogwarts. <laughs> All right. Hogwarts School, eh? Have you been there? <laughs> okay. So this man, he he's really truly deep in his knowledge of the astral uh, magic. Yeah. So at least he was there. You see what I mean? Yeah. So not many people can know like this. No. Yeah. Not many people can predict the wind. You know the storm the change of weather pattern or the uh, the coming of some great person like this my god this is really must be extraordinary can you imagine he was in the capital town in the palace and he can just see a little purple atmospheric uh pattern and then he know there's a great man's coming Can you believe this? And he was accurate. No one can be greater than Lao Tzu at that time. Could be ego, maybe, but no one can be greater than him. He was the uh, master of the fifth level. By if you read the Tao Te Ching, you know he is, right? No one below fifth level can write what he wrote in the Tao Te Ching. So oh, this guy is truly incredible, eh? He can know a sage from far away like that, and who never met before. Incredible! So this thing do truly happen, you know, because in the world there are some people like that. Yeah, always. And since times in memory, Lord, there's always somebody who knows the the greatness of someone. I mean, extraordinary greatness. Remember Jesus when he was not famous yet. John the Baptist told people that. Uh, I am uh, baptizing with water, but the one who came after me will be greater than I, and he will baptize with the fire of spirit. Remember that? Mm. And when he met Jesus, he said, "Lord, why you come and be baptized at my hand? You are the Lord." He knows that. You see that? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, life after life, we have this kind of people. Hmm? Now he's one of them. Once, wow, very exciting. Hmm. <laughs> I haven't read the whole story. I just read a little bit, and I know it's good for you. So, so now we're going to discover it all together. You know, both of us. I just read a little bit. You know, I don't always have time to read the whole thing unless I have a lot of time or I'm in doubt of the story. Yeah, but some some story I have no doubt. Then I don't read the whole thing. I just pick it and then I read it to you. Lao Tzu thanked Wen Shi for his greeting and his uh, humble hospitality, and he said to Wen Shi, "I'm just an old man who is leaving his old home in the east to live in his new home in the west." See, <laughs> I need to go there. But Wen Shi persisted. Honor one. When I saw a purple vapor in the sky moving from east to west. I knew that a great teacher would arrive in this town. Please stay and teach me about the Tao. The Tao. So Lao Tzu said, "What makes you think I'm the person you're looking for?" <laughs> He's making trouble. <laughs> Play hard to get. <laughs> no, it's not like that. But you know, most of the saints they don't know they are saints. Even you know, they don't think that they are saints. You know, because of their humility, they did not really know. Yeah, maybe later on when they have a lot of disciples already, and then the heaven let them know to make sure. If they ask heaven, "Oh, I'm really a teacher. Am I doing the right thing? Am I teaching the right thing?" Then heaven will give them sign or tell them that yes, you are that. Just continue do that. Just to assure the person. The saying that okay, you are doing okay, yeah. Otherwise, they don't they don't know themselves too much. Maybe they enlightened, they know this and that, but they did not think of themselves as a, in a capacity of a master of any kind. So Lao Tzu asked him like that, huh? What make you think I'm the person that you were looking for? So he said that he saw the purple in the sky and all that. So now he continued to explain to Lao Tzu. After some calculations. I deduced that it would arrive here this month. Wow! Oh my God! 
He even know the time of arrival of a master. Whoa. Last night, I also saw dragons and serpents hovering over Hanku Pass. So all these signs tell me that the great sage will arrive today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> This guy who is really professional in his job, eh? <laughs> no wonder the king uh, revere him and ask him to be his personal astronomer and astrologer. Because the king, in the old time, they don't have television to see if it's raining tomorrow <laughs> or what kind of temperature we have here, you know what I mean? And so they have to have a personal astrologer, astronomer, yeah, and feng shui master, etc., etc., yeah, so to protect their kingdom, you see, protect their throne and to know what is the, the best thing to do and what day. So this guy is really excellent at his job. And even if the king sometimes he interested in this subject, and he also knows one or two, but he also need confirmation with others of his uh, subordinate uh, astronomers in order to make sure that, number one, number two, the king is too busy to keep looking, gazing at the star every day, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, the king has other job to do. So, of course, he relies on these uh, astrologers and uh, astronomers to, to help him, of course, ne? Yeah, because sometimes even if you know the art of astronomy and astrology, you need time to calculate and to catch the sign and to interpret it and to do something about it. You see what I mean? It's like I told you yesterday, I know about the water, but what am I to do? Huh? I have a lot of work to do and I have other things to do. I cannot worry about the buckets. <laughs> Because uh, I know there are other people who will worry about that anyway, yeah? Okay. Besides, even if I know about that, if I know about water, so I say, oh, it cannot be possible. <laughs> The mind will tell me, no, no, not possible. We have a lot of water. Here is a residential, prestigious residential area. Nothing like that could happen. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> go back to do what you do. Go to sleep, go meditate, go drink tea, whatever. Yeah. Besides, when I know that, it's so late already, you know, like, uh, I don't know, when I left you, yeah, about two o'clock already, three o'clock, and I go home, take care of some uh, paperwork, and then, uh, you know, take care of myself, take a bath or something, and do some other thing, watch a little bit of late news, see if anything. I have to be together with the world, you know. <laughs> and then it's about five, six o'clock already, yeah? Everybody's sleeping, you know. I know you're snoring and I can hear it all over <laughs> from my room. <laughs> so never mind, you know. I just say, okay, everybody else have to take care of it. It's not my job to take care of buckets, no? of water. No? Okay, right. So this guy is incredible, eh? He even calculates all that and he knows the sage will arrive today. Yeah. In our association, there are also some people like that. They can know that thing, yeah. If they have to do it, they can do it. Just mostly they don't do much anymore because they meditate. You know, there's this thing, okay, nowadays we don't need so much, yeah? Yeah. It's fun to know something, but it's not necessary anymore. If you want to know if rain or not, just look on television. <laughs> if you know tomorrow hot, how many degrees, they even calculate it all for you already, 32 degrees, yeah. Wind, a shower or not, okay? Are we too loud or not? It's only nine o'clock, we're okay. Wonderful. I'm only one third of the story, my goodness. It's like a soap opera, continue tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, this, you see, this is a problem. It's not about the story. We talk about all kinds of things, yeah? <laughs> we go from uh, astronomer to the ox and then go back to television and. <laughs> All right, so Lao Tzu, then, after he, he told him everything, then Lao Tzu know this guy is not to be slightly treated because he knows everything. So Lao Tzu smiled and said, I have heard about your ability to read omens and divine uh, the future. Divine the future. You mean divining the future, yeah. Forecast the future, yeah. You have the potential to understand the Tao and help others along the path. 
So Wen Shi bow again and say, May I have the honor of knowing your name? He didn't even know his name. <laughs> but he knows he arrived this month, this day, and right there. <laughs> so he, he forsake everything just to move over there just to meet him. Can you believe such a person? Because since, uh, since childhood already in the story, they say that he's very interested in the Tao, eh? I mean, in the teaching, the truth, eh? the truth that you were having right now. Yeah. So that's why he does everything he can to get it. Wow, talking about sincerity, huh? Okay. Oof. Lao Tzu reply, I have many names, for I have appeared in many incarnations. Ah, now he tell him. Ah, now we have it. Voila. <laughs> Before he said, I'm only an old man passing by. What do you want to do with me? <laughs> so now he tell him the truth. I have many names. For I have appeared in many incarnations. I have taught the Yellow Emperor, I mean the, the oldest king of China, one of the oldest kings, as well as the kings Yao, Shun, and Yu, these are the sagely, saintly kings of China, very famous kings for their upright virtue and um, uh, excellent governance. Yeah, uh, very good people. Of course, now that we know why, huh? Lao Tzu has been teaching them all these times. Yes, in my current incarnation, I am named Li Er. Okay. That night, Wen Shi honored Lao Tzu with a feast. After the banquet, he prostrated himself before the sage and formally asked to be accepted as a disciple. Lao Tzu stayed in the border town for a hundred days and taught Wen Shi the art of the path. When it was time for his teacher to leave, Wen Shu declared, I would like to accompany you on your journey and serve you. Ha! <laughs> so familiar to me. <laughs> I want to help Master. <laughs> Let me help Master. <laughs> I want to stay here. <laughs> yeah, stay here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will have to build a thousand palaces for you, for all of you. <laughs> Even you take turn to come group by group, you will still have problem, <laughs> you know, uh, meeting your demand. You see what I mean? And if I let you come, or if you have like each one have one room, then you have to wait another hundred years to come here. <laughs> so I'm sorry for the squeezing uh, situation. Okay? Yeah. But you're lucky already. You're, you're lucky. No, no, I, uh, you don't know yet. The next group will be double this size. <laughs> oh. lucky. You're lucky. Now you know why you're lucky, huh? Yeah. huh? More deep trades coming. What? More deep trades coming. <laughs> Big trade, yeah. <laughs> Big trade and deep cup. <laughs> okay. So Lao Tzu refused, huh? saying, although your roots are deep, what he means by root? Is he a tree or something? <laughs> huh? Knowledge. Knowledge. And? Spiritual practice. Spiritual sincerity, yes, and practice. Although your roots are deep, you are not ready to climb with me to the clouds or fly to the four directions. What he means by that? Is he really flying like an aeroplane or something? Huh? Beyond the free world? Beyond the three world, yeah. Means he's not as the level to accompany Lao Tzu. When he's going around, he will only make him trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds familiar, that's why I know. I know very well. <laughs> Good intention, a bad level. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, he continued, huh, talking to Wunshu, you have a good understanding of the teachings, but you are still lacking in experience. When you can merge with the natural way, go to Sichuan 
and look for a blue ox. Well, you know what the blue ox mean by now, right? I hope he didn't change into red color by that time. <laughs> Confuse the guy. <laughs> Can you believe it? Go to Suchuan and look for a blue ox. Oh, what a master. So difficult. No address, nothing, just a blue ox. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, we have address. We have postcode. Huh? Postal code, still cannot find. We have car and everything, GPS even. And difficult to find a place. Can you imagine, go to Suchon, it's a big city, you know? Big uh, province. Look for a blue ox. Now, you cannot say I'm strict anymore. You know that. Huh? <laughs> if I tell you, <laughs> uh, go to France or <laughs> go to England and look for a red horse. <laughs> It would be similar, right? <laughs> oh, wow, what kind of master? So strict like this. It looks like he doesn't want him to come. Hmm? But never mind. The ox will show you where to find me. Ah, this is a special ox. Wow. <laughs> Have GPS on him. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, probably, we have to say, OK, go to Munich and look for a Mercedes <laughs> with a GPS, and then the Mercedes will bring me to you. But he has to have a driver's license, you see. <laughs> ah, in those times, it's easier. You don't need to have a license to tr ride an ox. Huh? <laughs> so easy. OK. He then dictated a book of 5,000 words to his uh, student. This book was the Tao Te Ching, yeah, because he, in the other story, it says that uh, this officer uh, wanted to keep Lao Tzu longer or to follow him, but Lao Tzu don't want. So he said, okay, then please, at, at least before, before you go, write me something. Yeah, so he wrote this book for him. Yes. Almost like force, you know, <laughs> like, uh, if you want to go free, then <laughs> give me something. <laughs> Like, here, give me a cup or a tray. <laughs> At least her master is not here, but uh, her shoes are around, or her table is here, you know? <laughs> Something is here, right? <laughs> a DVD, a television, okay. So Wen Shi built a tower at Hanku Pass, Hanku Pass, and devoted himself to practicing what he had learned from Lao Tzu. One day, he looked at the sky and saw bands of multicolored clouds circling the North Star. When tendrils of starlight came through the window of Shu's meditation room and alighted on him, he knew that it was time for him to travel to Suchuan and find his teacher. What an email, huh? <laughs> 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 the greenest ever. No need uh, electricity, yeah? And no need uh, any uh, environmental uh, problem. Uh, just a cloud drift on his shoulder. <laughs> That's it. Okay, got it. <laughs> I'm going. I'm coming to Master. Wow. That's a nice way to <laughs> contact, eh? No need contact person, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> He must have a very special computer, no? Mm. I wish we could buy those things, huh? And give it to you guys. <laughs> but nowadays we have even better, huh? You don't even need to see me at all. You just stay home and watch TV. I even saw me on the computer sometime live, you know? What do you mean, not the same? <laughs> It's better than the purple cloud yes. and tendrils. <laughs> it has a picture of me even. Yeah, it's better, but... <laughs> this guy, he has only a little tendrils, tendrils of the purple cloud, yeah? And the cloud don't even say nothing. Just come and then drip on him, that's it. And then he knows his master sent for him. Oh, and you guys, so difficult, so difficult. <laughs> All right, you're not even happy with live program? <laughs> ah. How about live program on TV? Beautiful. Good, eh? Yeah. Good, eh? Okay. Maybe we can, we can do that. Maybe we can do that. I just sit in my room and then talk, and then you guys turn on TV. We can have live like that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, it's cool. Why don't we do that, huh? Mm. Better than now, huh? No. What? 
No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why no again? Hmm? You so difficult to please you. Huh? It's like so called mother in law or something. <laughs> mother in law, even less difficult. Okay, let's see. All right. Of course I know you like to see me. I also love to see you. It just will cost you money to travel, airplane tickets and bus, and okay. uh, here you have to pay for the tray. <laughs> or the cup, whatever. Huh? Or both. <laughs> huh? And water, even, yeah. But you also spent some money for us, too. Did I? Yeah. But the reward is better to be on this one. Are you worth it? Don't worry about it. You worth it, yeah. Your, your tray is even more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's all paid. We don't own anybody anything. Yeah. Master, is there a day that you let us to know what you have done to us? What I have? What? The day that comes that you let us to know what have you done to us? What have I done to you? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, you do a lot of things that we don't know. Really. Do you know? I don't understand what he wants. He means what you've done for us. You don't know? Like what? Oh, everything that he then you don't know. No? If you don't know, it cannot hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you want to know? No, no, I mean there are so many things that you do, we are not aware of it, you see. So, what do you want to know for? It's so many people, how can I tell it all? No, I mean just uh, maybe up there. Send the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays we have email, you know. <laughs> we have telephone and email. It's, it's, it's more easy. Okay. When Wen Shi arrived in Sichuan, he began to ask people if they had seen a blue ox. Uh, this man is crazy, they say to each other, you know, the citizens of Sichuan. Uh, who has ever seen an ox with a blue color? <laughs> I told you, Lao Tzu get a blue color. You know why it's blue? Huh? Is it really the color blue? Do you think it was really physically blue? No. No. Only the assistant of Wen Shu saw it blue. It's the color of the aura of the, the ox. Yeah, that's special ox because it's a special being incarnate in to be an ox for Lao Tzu to ride. And that person, because Lao Tzu rides in him every day, of course he also has spiritual uh, elevation. So he emits this kind of blue light. Okay? Sometimes you see some spiritual master also have blue light come from the eyes. Like when Vivekananda uh, was in America, some people see him with a blue color of aura. Yeah. And there was one kid who was drowning, and then he saw Vivekananda came with blue light, yeah, and get him out of water. Later he told some people, yeah, a blue color is one of the master color, yeah, blue light from the eyes or from, for the aura, but n not the one only color. Some people see white only, some people see golden only, some people see pink only, some people see blue only. Yeah, some people see purple only. Actually, it must have all okay. kinds, okay? Yeah. Depends on the level, they see what color, yeah. So now the blue, <laughs> the blue was the only one color that they see from the ox, and perhaps the ox have only that color of light around him, you know, the aura around him. That's why it looks like blue. Remember Krishna? They say Krishna has blue color. Oh no, his skin is not blue. <laughs> Maybe the Indian people are a little dark skin, but blue, blue Indian. <laughs> the blue Indian you cannot find, <laughs> okay? All right. So blue is the, the, the color of the light that the, the master emits at that time. So the ox probably is very high being also. I told you, huh? Uh, animals sometimes they are highly developed being. So this ox is special also, yeah? Okay. I told you that everybody look at my dog. That's one of my dogs and love him so much. Everybody wants to take him home <laughs> because he's so beautiful. He emits love and light, you know. Sometimes they don't see the light, but they feel he's so special. 
<laughs> Rottweiler is all over everywhere, you know, and people don't really like to have Rottweiler that much because of the bad reputation. Why on earth do they want my Rottweiler? And the vet and the nurse, they've seen thousands or millions of Rottweiler in their life, or at least uh, many of them coming to the vet clinic every day, you know, or at least every month or every week. It's not possible that they have never seen a Rottweiler in their life. You know, so why on earth they want my Rottweiler? You know, my Rottweiler. <laughs> I say no, and they keep insisting. Everywhere he goes, they just look at him once. I can I have it? <laughs> I say no, it's my dog. <laughs> if you want, I buy you another. No, no, I just want him. <laughs> I say you just cannot have him. <laughs> How can? He's my dog. You know. I special took him home. I, I can give him any other dog, or ten other Rottweiler. I don't mind, but not this dog. I don't know how they would treat him. You see, I don't know if they give him vegetarian food or not. Uh, so, uh, but you know, people keep saying to each other, "Oh, this guy is crazy." You know, whoever seen an ox with <laughs> blue color. <laughs> Even then, he's not disappointed. He did not give up, so he keep going from one place to another and continue his search. And one day, as he was, you know, having a rest on the roadside, he saw a young cow herd walking down the hillside, leading a blue ox. Ah, so he ran, he ran to the boy and said, Can you please tell me who the owner of this ox is? So the cow herd replied, Hey, my lady has a child who loves this ox. Uh, the ox ran away two days ago. Since then, my young master has not stopped crying. When Wen Shu heard this, he was very delighted. He said to the boy, Okay, when you see your young master, please tell him that Wen Shu has arrived. A young master, not an old, old man. I guess Lao Tzu passed away at that time. And now he reincarnated. Yeah and to a small boy. And now he has also another blue ox. Ah, Lao Tzu has already predicted that he will be reincarnated there after he died. Remember when he met him, he's already an old man. Yeah, perhaps he passed away after. And so now he's became an old baby already. <laughs> but one should know that his master. He said, when you see your young master, I mean boy, you know, please tell him I arrived already. One should has arrived. So, the cowherd took the ox to his master and said, Wen Shu asked me to tell you that he has arrived. The child jumped up, <laughs> clapped his hands, and said, He is finally here. Invite him in at once. Oh, even little child know already. This kind of mystery, nobody believe it, huh? It's okay. You believe, right? Believe. Yeah, this kind of thing. <laughs> So when Wen Shi stepped into the mansion, the child was transformed into Lao Tzu. Thousands of rays of golden light emanated from his body, and purple aura glowed around his head. A canopy emerged from the ground, and inside the pavilion, was a seat surrounded by lotus flowers. You know, probably nobody else saw it like that. Probably only his disciple once saw it. See what I mean? Yeah. Because he see it in a different dimension. Yeah? He don't see the child there. He saw a real form of his teacher. Yeah. So the old man, I mean Lao Tzu, <laughs> walked to the chair sat down and said to Wen Shi, When I left you, you were but a, a novice? A who? A, huh? A student? Yeah, a novice, a, a young student. Okay. Yeah. You were but a novice who aspired to cultivate the Tao. Today I see a man with an air of an immortal. An immortal, well, I mean the one who never died. Man who already transcend life and death doesn't mean that he won't die. Otherwise, we would have found him right now, and I don't have to come here. <laughs> Otherwise, Lao Tzu would not have 
being reincarnated and become another child. You see what I mean? So, immortal in this sense means you don't die anymore. You transcend the cycle of birth and death and karma, retribution. That's it. Some people don't understand. They think, okay, we go then find the elixir in the Himalaya, something, and become immortal. Since time immemorial, always the kings go around, tell people, go around and find the elixir of immortality for me. How? Even if you live long, your teeth will come out and everything is different. <laughs> you can't have plastic surgery forever. Right. So. <laughs> he continued, mm. Your spirit has journeyed to the purple chamber of the celestial palace. You have merged with the North Star, and your name has been entered into the roster of the immortals. Mm. How nice. Yeah. I wonder if his name is also uh, engraved on his tray or not. <laughs> on his cup, a stainless steel cup. <laughs> what do you think? Huh? Huh? Perhaps, eh? Does that mean that he comes like as a master? Is it wrong? <laughs> yeah, it could be. could be that he has reached already the fifth level. Yeah. So, I'm asking you about the name, whether it's engraved in the cups or not, and you're talking nonsense. <laughs> you tell us, please. You are too serious. <laughs> we are we were having fun, and he's talking about the fifth level. Tayaga, <laughs> so boring. <laughs> Such a boring saint. <laughs> When Lao Tzu finished speaking, <laughs> now they're laughing because translation just finished. <laughs> when Lao Tzu finished speaking, the room was suddenly filled with celestial messengers and immortals. Wen Shu stepped onto a cloud and was escorted into the immortal realm by the personal attendants of the highest lords of heaven. Ah, he passed away. Right? Huh? What a nice thing to do. Yeah. Ah, so here is a, here is a note said Wen Shu that uh, his name is also Wen Zhu. Wen Zhu. Uh, <laughs> Wen Zhu. It's like mosquito. <laughs> lived in the later part of the Chow dynasty. This is about 11th century BC. Yeah. So he is reputed to be the first student of Lao Tzu and is the author of the Taoist classic Wen Tzu. Wen Tzu or Wen Tzu? Wen Tzu. <laughs> okay, finish now. At that time, he probably had a grand vision, eh? That he is going up to the sky, uh, escorted by the attendant of the highest rim. So he reached the fifth level then. Now you happy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> My God, can't even have a joke with you. Don't you understand some joke? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for yourself. <laughs> My God, huh? Such a fun, and he always fix it on the towel, you know. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. You will arrive there, but don't have to be too <laughs> clingy to it, you know. We have fun when we are in this physical world, you know. Oh, and that's why you have your tray and your cup. <laughs> if, <laughs> stand a steel cup. If we always fix on the towel, then we. Oof, probably should not eat at all, yeah? But uh, eating, drinking is also a little break for the day, huh? Yeah, I'm telling you. Sometimes I work so hard and so tiring, you know? Of course I can paint and I can sing and I can dance, but I can't do that every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if, okay, go and have a little soup or a little bread or something, it's a kind of a, a change, yeah? Yeah, it's also very uh, pleasant for the mind. 
to not to feel too burdened, you know. <laughs> and then he continued the marathon afterwards. <laughs> okay, so you enjoy the food, all right? Yeah, and if you want to be breatharian, you're also welcome. You just do it yourself. <laughs> because what you don't eat, the next person will eat it. <laughs> you pay more? <laughs> no, I don't need. No, whatever, enough already. You know, for transportation and, and food, that's it. Nothing else. Nothing else you need to pay so much, okay? The house paid already. I don't like that. <laughs> if I don't have money, I don't buy, yeah? Uh, very simple philosophy of life. <laughs> what you don't have, you don't buy. <laughs> yeah. It's like in the shop, what you break, you buy. <laughs> so don't break anything. <laughs> no, you pay for the food, it's okay, yeah? And transportation costs and all that, you know, because yeah, you just have to be correct, just like I'm correct. I also pay for what I eat here, even if it's my house. Yeah, because if I don't pay that, I eat your food, no? <laughs> and then you have less food. And that's not fair, yeah. All the workers here, they pay also, or I pay for them. Nobody have free meal here. <laughs> there's no free lunch. <laughs> the Americans, they say there's no free lunch in this world. It's true. <laughs> no, we just have to be correct, yeah? That's all, yeah? Otherwise, um, if you don't have uh, enough money, you don't pay. It's okay, yeah? But let us know so we, we pay in. Yeah, let's the, the reception also we pay in so that everybody have enough food. Hmm? Now and again you come here and you enjoy the food, it's okay. But just eat enough so that you can meditate, okay? Otherwise you just eat <laughs> <laughs> Digesting the food, it's okay too, it's okay, whatever. You come only a few days, you enjoy, okay? Relax. You know, you know what it's like? You, you are incredible, you. You can sit and sleep and stand, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that so you don't need bed anymore. <laughs> no wonder in, in the room you put all the beds up. <laughs> no need. <laughs> you sleep in the air already. <laughs> yeah, so she was sleeping while standing there. So she just hear a little noise and then come out, that's it. <laughs> no matter who. Because <laughs> I, go, I go and try not to have a lot of light. I go in the dark with the phone light. You know, and she's standing there in the dark also, you know. <laughs> and when I see there's no need to, uh, the light, sometimes I can see without the light. So I don't need, and she don't have the light because what for standing there, not with the flashlight, you know. <laughs> oh. the, the people, they should stop, they don't stop. And when they should stop, they don't stop. <laughs> and when I'm coming to see you, they stop me all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, my goodness or a flashing light in front of my face so that they can see you. They can see me, you know? Yeah, some people don't see me, so go grab me and stop me. Oh, that okay. And then some other, you know, see me coming out and know it's me, flash the light in front of my face, like, so that he can see me, you know? <laughs> not, not on the road, but to see me. I say, on the road, man, not on me. <laughs> Just blind me like that. I can't even see the row anymore. Normally, normally without his help, I could walk around. <laughs> you know, when you used to with the, uh, you know, just a starlight or city light, simple light, you can see it because the white uh, pebble, you can see it. I did not need uh, the light sometime, you know? I don't need it. I can walk like this. And then he helped me. He shined the light right in front of my eyes. Then I'm blind. You know? I can't even see nothing. And it happened oh, a lot of times. That's why I say, please don't help me. <laughs> I'm used to being alone, okay? Just leave me alone. Just stand there, okay? <laughs> don't do anything, please. If I ask them, please do it. If I don't, please, no need. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. The hoover is really incredible. You just stand there, okay, like the palace uh, guard. They don't move. Yeah? Even if you tickle them, they don't move. So if you're a hoover, just be like that for me, please. Everything else, I take care. Remember, remember you say, Master, take care of everything? <laughs> Then let me, okay? Oh, please, I know where I walk around here in my house. If not, I have a, uh, my mobile phone. I turn it off low, you know, so it doesn't ring, and then I use it.
just enough light for me to walk so to don't disturb you, you know? Because the flashlight is very blinding, you know? And when you flash around like this, it's disturbing people, yeah? Especially when they are deep in their sleep. You know? <laughs> like, like what you're doing here, yeah? So please, just uh, don't disturb people, okay? <laughs> okay, good. Now, we go back to where you were, no more, sleeping. Yeah? <laughs> Come on, turn off the light now. Everything dark. Have a good dream. <laughs> okay. When you get up, <laughs> you can have some, okay? I think a couple each, yeah? About this much, otherwise not enough here. Here only. The rest you have everywhere else, okay? If you want, and you think, Master, don't give me anything. <laughs> yeah, I pay for my own tray. And <laughs> now you can be sure. <laughs> Maybe a blue ox in there. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being good boy. <laughs> yeah. It's good that you can laugh, you know, that means you relax. Huh? Yes. That means you're not too serious. That means it's good. That means you really Loose now. Yeah, so I can relax too. Because if I sit in front of somebody like this, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> Did I do something wrong? <laughs> Did I say something wrong? <laughs> okay, okay, turn up, line up, quick. Everything, come on.